and visualization literacy. It's exciting to see people are interested in this. I know we have a small group today, but we do have some activities planned that hopefully will be fun. Um, we are from Oregon State University eCampus. Um, and my name is Amy Donnelly. I'm the assistant to the executive director of market development and student experience. However, at the time of submitting this proposal, I was the administrative program specialist in the research unit. So I'm excited I can still be here with Mary Ellen today to present. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mary Ellen Dallastrito. I am the assistant director of the eCampus research unit at Oregon State University. Can you hear us all right? Yeah, okay, great. All right. So um, we're going to begin by just giving you a little bit of information about Oregon State uh, eCampus uh, specifically. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our research unit. Um, and the slide here will show you some of the things that we're up to. So the Oregon State University eCampus research unit uh, conducts award-winning research on online education. And our unit aims to support colleagues like you with actionable research in online education. And these are examples of what we're doing. We have an online uh, learning efficacy research database where you can go in and compare the learning outcomes um, in different studies in online and hybrid um, education, uh, online versus face-to-face, -face, hybrid versus face-to-face, -face, et cetera. We also have two recently launched books, High Impact Practices uh, in Online Education and the Business of Innovating Online. I have a card over here if you're interested in that second book. Um, and we also have a podcast called Research in Action I encourage you to look at. Um, and we also do national and local studies and we'll reference some of those in our presentation today. All right, so let me do a little session overview for you all. Um, today what we're going to do is talk just a little bit about um, our work and a little bit about a little bit about our uh, focus on data visualization uh, and literacy in the eCampus research unit. Um, so we'll give you a little bit of background there. We'll talk a little bit about common graph and uh, chart types um, and, and let you do some discovery in that area. Then we're going to have an activity where you're actually going to apply what we're talking about this morning. And then we'll end with our takeaways and resources for learning more. So the session really is intended to just be a taste uh, of what we're talking about in terms of data visualization. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Amy. All right. So uh, why is data visualization important? So before we answer that and just see what some of you think, how many of you have seen a data visualization that has just either been confusing or just hard to understand? <laughs> okay, most people, yes, hopefully this session helps a little bit with that today. Um, but to get down to the root, why do you think data visualization is important or how is it helpful? Any thoughts? <clears throat> yes, so helps com communicate complex data, yep. Yes, thank you. So adding that visual element, so hopefully kind of just improving that understanding in a way. Yeah. Yes, um, some data visualizations could be misleading if maybe they're presented incorrectly or maybe not using the right chart or graph. Any other thoughts? It helps you like convey meaning out of just a bunch of numbers. Yes. So conveying meaning out of a bunch of numbers, how one data point relates to other data points, hopefully a visualization helps with that. So I think everyone just told us this next slide. Hopefully a data visualization will help tell a story and those relating data points, you're kind of gathering a story from that data. It can help communicate a point efficiently. So again, that visual layer is hopefully giving you a quick just look and seeing what it is you need to understand from that set of data. And then hopefully it can help improve that understanding, which I know we just um, someone just mentioned about that added visual layer that can be helpful. So those are some things we're going to go through today and Mary Ellen's going to go through the next set and give you some examples of different um, inappropriate chart and graph types. 
So I thought I would mention that we, a couple of years ago, we went down this road of really kind of learning uh, about some of the background that we're going to talk to you today uh, and trying to improve the data visualizations that we were doing in our research unit. So um, Amy and I often now go and see things that we're like, ooh, that could be better. So it's, it's, it's a learning process. Okay, so let's kind of look at some inappropriate chart types. This is one way to kind of begin, right? So sometimes we can see a chart and go, hmm, this isn't quite right. So what, what's going on with this chart? Let me ask all of you. What's, is there a story being told by this chart? What is it? Take a look at that for a minute. Yeah, the scale, right, there's no scale on the percentage. That, that's an issue, good, yep. What else is going on here? It looks like something that's happening over time. Over time, exactly, yeah, so great. And so when we often see these kinds of line graphs, right, you often think there's some connection from one point to the other. In this case, that's not what is actually going on here, right? So that's one way this is inappropriate. Um, so this is actually a piece of data from one of our reports that we kind of mocked up in this way for this example. Um, we, had, we struggled when we had this data point uh, from a survey that we were working with to try to figure out how to represent it for several reasons. One being that we have some dollar figures and then some not dollar figures over here. Uh, and so, so this was a challenging bit of data. But what the point we want to make from this chart is that, yeah, sometimes if you're looking at a, a trend line, um, you know, that's inappropriate here when we're not really talking about change over time in this case. So that's an example of inappropriate chart type. Now, you've all seen the pie chart, right? In some cases, we have, um, you know, data visualizations that, you know, may be not inappropriate, but they don't help you understand the data in any way. Um, and so here's that same data point again. Um, and what are we learning from this pie chart? Nothing. <laughs> not much. Okay, maybe nothing. Yeah. Yeah, right. So we're at least seeing, you can at least see with this pie chart what the larger slices are, right? Right, exactly. Right, so we've got this qualitative and numeric kind of responses in it. Exactly. So it's not uh, exactly where we wanted to go with this. So after kind of looking at this data point, we decided to basically go with a table, right? <laughs> So anyway, there are others that can be visually taxing, right? And you've all seen these kinds of bar charts. And this is great. This is a different data point here about students choosing different devices for different purposes. And we've all seen charts like this. Uh, the challenge with this kind of chart, however, is that you've got to read across, right? If you want to know about Canvas in this case, um, you've got to read the blue bars and you've got to look across and compare the blue bars you want to know about video, you've got to look at the orange bars, right? And so this isn't really very efficient for you as, as the viewer. And so, you know, while the, we see these as pretty typical, we see these in journal articles, we see these in reports all the time, there are better ways to do this. Um, and so what we ended up with this chart is we ended up doing some small multiples uh, and kind of pulling out and doing um, different uh, charts for each of those types. So if you're interested, I'll show you that in one of our reports. But the point here being is that there is sometimes inappropriate, then there's sometimes appropriate, and then there's sometimes better, right? So um, all part of thinking about what you're trying to tell and what story you're talking about. So let's look at the appropriate use of common charts and graphs. And you're going to take over here. All right. So a inappropriate chart or graph type is not always the cause. Sometimes it can maybe either be small font or color. We're not going to go into that today, but that is another element of data visualization that can make a difference. Um, but as you saw with the pie chart, sometimes it may just not help you understand, especially if a pie chart's purpose is to help you understand parts of a whole. You want to make sure that pie chart totals 100% and not 110. <laughs> that could be an issue as far as understanding that. So this next section, we're actually going to do a bit of discovery and activity. Um, and since we have a fairly small group, um, it looks like we're going to try and break into small groups. So it looks like there's a group here, 
Um, in total, we want no more than four groups, so you can assemble how you would like, but I'll just give you some instructions first of what we're going to do. We actually brought a resource with us today. We have several decks, which these are pretty fun. These were utilized um, quite a bit in the research unit. They're called chart chooser cards, and we listed the resource up here, chartchoosercards.com, in case you're interested in looking into them further since we did bring them with us today. But what you're going to do in your groups, um, and we also have an activity sheet that we'll hand out after you've done this part, is actually just become familiar with the cards that are in this deck. And the way that this deck is used is there are lots of different colors <laughs> within the deck that represent different chart and graph types. And there is a little tutorial card in the front. So you'll see the first question is, what is the key piece of information you're trying to show? So with that, then you go down and see, oh, I'm trying to represent survey responses. So all of the orange cards represent different charts and graphs that could be helpful for survey responses. Or I'm trying to represent comparisons in my data set. Then you would look at the purple cards because those might have charts and graphs that would be helpful for representing that type of data. So the idea in the next five minutes or so, once you get into groups, is to just go through the cards, get familiar with some of the charts and graphs, <laughs> And I should point out, there are some pretty intense chart and graph types on these cards. Some where it's labeled, it's complicated. They are for very large data sets um, that we won't be talking about today. But they are in there in case you're curious. Um, so this next part, um, Mary Ellen will come around with the cards. So if you could please assemble yourselves into those smaller groups. And, and we'll do this. you have round tables. Yeah. This is technically a round table, but we didn't get them. So, uh, Please go ahead and move chairs around if you want to get together in a small group around one table. That would be great. Like
So I, it looks like everyone hopefully had a chance to look through the cards. Um, did anybody find this helpful, just seeing the different charts and graph types? Great. So now what we're going to do, and I know this is a bit of a fast forward version of applying what we just talked about, but the handout that you have in front of you, we have two sets of data. It's, it's pretend data, but we need these so that Hopefully you can just get a little practice using the cards and identifying, again, what is maybe that main point of the data that you're trying to communicate, because starting there hopefully helps you narrow down what chart and graph types to start selecting or what you think would be helpful for communicating that main point. So you are welcome to obviously talk with your groups, but utilizing those cards, there are three bullet points underneath each data set, because there could be more than one chart or graph type that you think would be helpful for communicating what you're seeing in that data set. So we're going to take the next 10 minutes or so, Mary Ellen and I will be walking around a few questions, and go ahead and select um, some chart or graph types, just writing them down on the bullet points if you're grouped there, of what you think would be helpful to represent those sets of data. <laughs>
And we would draw um, things on the board. Yes. And, yeah. No, that's not going to work. We would draw. Yes, lots of drawing. That's a critical point for us. I can plot this group that I don't want to hold up in the presentation. But uh, what I'm drawn to is when you talk about how you discuss it and then you make a decision. I'm the kind of person that I want variations. I want to present yeah. different yeah. pictures. I'll try to answer the same question, but it, it communicates in three different ways. It yep. speaks to somebody and it draws somebody to like that. So I, I know I. Uh, tend towards that and yet I admire the people who know this is crystal clear and this is the one example. It's pretty rare about. that we're crystal clear yeah. on these things. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm, coming, I'm getting reactive. Yeah. What, oh, Amy comes about. to me with, here's three versions and we sit and ponder. Well, I like this, but I like that. And then usually it's the fourth version that we <laughs> use, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. And it can vary, I would say, because depending on what it is you need to pull out of that data for your audience. Yeah. So if maybe you're looking for... Um, high percentages and what the rates are for something and you want to display that or what you need to focus on are low percentages and a low rate for something. I don't know what data I'm trying to think of, but it depends on what it is that your audience needs to um, understand. Mm -hmm. If they're needing to see the deficit, maybe they need to see the surplus, mm -hmm. things like that. That was actually my second topic because mm -hmm. when I evaluate this, it, it becomes an issue how well do I know my audience? Right. And then I, I really start questioning, well, I'm not sure if they think this way or that way, mm -hmm. and then I mean, you have different strategies of yep. making choices. Like and then you go out and try to find some of that audience and say, what do you see here? Yes. Yeah. Well, what do you think of this? And see if they get it, right? Yes. And that's a great point. Um, another thing that in the research unit we would do occasionally is take a data visualization to someone that was not familiar with the mm -hmm, data, mm -hmm. and that way they're not seeing it the same way you're constantly seeing it and understanding it, and just asking, what do you get from this? Mm -hmm. And hopefully somebody who is not familiar or has seen it before can help give you some helpful feedback, and there has mm -hmm. been times where we thought, oh, well, I'm glad someone pointed that out, yep. because we are going to redo this now. Yep. So um, it can be helpful, although it does take time to work on. So. I'm excited to hear, I know we're excited to hear, there was great conversation going on, to hear what some of the visualizations are that you selected for your data set. So this first one up at the top looks like maybe survey responses. Um, there could be different ways to display this. Are there any charts or graphs that came out right away that you wrote down within your groups? You can just say them out loud. 
stacked bar chart, yes. So that one showing kind of across all the way for one age group, maybe how it's strongly liked and the comparison all the way across for the single age group, yes. Any others come out of that one? You could try to set her to do a stacked column, yes. yes. Yep. And that could be something maybe you need to save space somewhere. But, you know, if, if it's being represented in a way that you can read it in a cohesive way, yes. Anything else on that first set? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Small multiples, um, that I would say also is a great option when you see lots of different things that need to be compared side by side. We do have an example in our report up here too of a set of small multiples where it was a very large data set, mm -hmm. but it was lots of things that needed to be communicated all the way across. Did you have Yeah. So possibly so, just seeing kind of the differences between strongly disagree, disagree, agree, that whole sequence, um, that could be an option. And again, just even drawing them out to see that could be helpful. Yeah, I'm wondering in that case if combining the strongly disagree and disagree and the agree and strongly agree and you could just have an agree, disagree, if that, if that didn't matter so much to you, that you could combine the data in that way. So. And that's what we got into after we spent our whole time just on that first data set, and, and I was really surprised at how we could take such simple numbers. Yeah. Uh, I know well, these are three pie charts, and right. it's just it's just numbers. But then I started talking about well, what about if you actually take the data and you map the, the trends? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's one example. Yeah. What are the differences between for the age groups? Yeah. yeah. That's great. And, and then that we, we also landed on what you just described, just taking the whole. What's the, because we saw a huge trend of 82% agree mm -hmm. with them, and then it yep. drops down to 65, and then it drops down to 50%. Yep. Well, if we're taking a, a marketing decision of who, who, we, you know, who likes our laptop or who we market it to, again, depending on our question yeah. and the audience, can you, can you use the numbers mm -hmm. of Good. Excellent. Advanced. Yes. Very good. Advanced example of data driven <laughs> decision making. Excellent. Um, great, so thank you for your feedback on that. Um, sounds like some great options that you all picked out. What about the second set of data on the course pretest and post-test averages on our sample set here? Any thoughts come to mind? It looks like what type of data are you looking at here? Is it survey? Is it comparison? Mm -hmm. Comparison. Mm -hmm. We were comparing pretest and post test. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. charts or graphs stood out to you as maybe being helpful ones to represent that data? A line graph. A line graph. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you could see the change just visually in the line. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Any of the so, um, the dot plot, yes, so a dot plot can be a helpful way to represent. You see the pretest and the post test on a line with the dots. And um, any others? Did anybody think of maybe overlapping bars or any slope a slope graph? Yes, we could directly see the change from pretest, post test. Mm -hmm. So great. It sounds like everyone really dug in there and thought of some and looked through the cards to go through the different options. So this next part you'll get to do some more practice. I'm excited um, for the next section Marilyn's going to talk through because there will be some before and after examples, mm -hmm. so she's going to take it from here. All right, so hopefully that was useful for you to be able to look through those cards. Um, let's look at some other things as an entire group instead of in your small groups. And we're going to uh, talk about several questions. We're going to look at um, applying some of these things that you were, were just looking at and some of the things we've been talking about. Um, and and as a full group, we can talk about maybe improvements. So here's a lovely pie chart again. So let's think about um, the focus that we've been talking about here in terms of uh, the visualization telling a story, communication, and understanding. So what does this data visualization communicate to you over here on the, in our pie chart? What do, you, what do you get from this? Right, yeah. You can't read the words, right? That's intentional in this case, maybe. 
Yeah, this here says primarily online with occasional face-to-face. -face. Yeah, so basically this is the big big slice that you're seeing, correct? Yep, 52%. We're taking their... Yeah, and then this one over here is face-to-face -face 35%, right? Those are what you're visually drawn to typically is what are the biggest slices of the pie, and then there's all these little ones, right? Um, do you get a whole lot of understanding from this pie chart? Meh, mm -hmm. maybe. Meh. Just the yeah, basic facts. Well, if, the yeah, I did, we didn't give you the question in this case exactly. This question was about, um, you know, how do you take your, how how do you take classes? Primarily online, face to face, both. No, it's basically what do you, you know, how how many, you know, what is your your primary educational modality in this case? Yeah, they're five. It, yeah, it's four percent, five percent, and four percent. So they're really close, and they're identical in two cases. So again, let's go to this question of appropriateness. Is this a, is this pie chart appropriate for this data? Yeah, it's generally appropriate, right? I mean, you you, you have we have this um, you know percentage that we need to represent this hundred percent, and here's how it breaks out in terms of how students are taking courses. Now, can we improve upon it? Generally, yes. So what? how could we improve this? What might be better? Yeah, we could rearrange the pie so that the larger ones are, are on the right right side clockwise. Have a better title. Well, I didn't give you a title, but yeah. <laughs> but what about another chart type? Should we throw out the pie? Bar chart. Would that be better? Yeah, exactly. It might be easier to see the 52, the 35, and then those little slices, right? So that's a possibility. So let's do our before and after. Voila. <laughs> so this might be how you start, just to say, okay, let's look at this. And then here is our transformation of it. So we decided to do this horizontal bar. Um, and again, ordering them in a way that made sense, at least for this data. So the highest percentage at the top, the smallest percentage is at the bottom. And then we also did something here with color, right? And the idea of communicating and telling a story, well, we wanted to really highlight that highest percentage that were, were students taking courses primarily online with occasional face-to-face -face courses. Better? Yeah. yeah. And so communicating a little bit more effectively uh, a little bit clearer. There's other options, but that was what we landed on for this example. Okay, so let's go to the next one, example number two. So this came from a study that we did on closed captioning and transcripts. And so we've got a typical uh, kind of bar chart. And so these were themes that came up in terms of a student's open-ended responses to a question about um, why transcripts and captions were helpful for their learning. Okay, and so we see um, the closed captions are in blue and the orange is the transcripts. So let's go through the same set of questions. What does this data visualization communicate to you? Let's see. There's a lot there, yeah. The, the, if you can't see these, it's accuracy, comprehension, retention, and engagement. Yeah, so you're seeing kind of a difference here in these two categories. Yeah, so more of them said they're using transcripts for accuracy reasons, right, than closed captions for accuracy reasons. And then that kind of flips a little bit in terms of comprehension. So more of them are talking about uh, comprehension with closed captioning. Um, but there's still a pretty high percentage saying transcripts are helping with, with comprehension as well. Okay, so does the visualization add to your understanding of the data? I see some yeses, I see some noes. What do you think? You want to give us feedback? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little hard to track it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Other thoughts? So it may not, again, is it is it appropriate? Maybe. Could it be improved? Yes. Probably, right? So what do you suggest? 
Overlapping bars? Ha ha, voila. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> so yeah, that, that was what we had suggested for this, this uh, set of data. Why? Because what, we're, what we were particularly interested here in is that closed caption and transcript um, kind of gap. And so by overlapping them, you can kind of see where everything lands in relationship to the other. Now, if that wasn't the interest, then you might choose a different uh, chart or graph type. But this is, uh, again, if you wanted to kind of look across at all the blue um, bars as a unit, it's a little bit harder to do that with the traditional bar chart. Uh, and in this case, it's a little easier to look at transcripts, for example, in the orange and get a better sense of it. One way to possibly do it. Um, and so in this case, what we're seeing is it just improves a little bit of the comprehension. And you see we did some other things, too, where we moved the... Okay. Uh, where we moved the uh, uh, key uh, to a more prominent location as well. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to Amy now. She's going to uh, talk about resources. Yes. We're about at the end of our session. Um, we'll cover a few takeaways, and um, it's exciting to just even hear you all talk about the improvements so quickly um, compared to those graphs and charts that Marielle just went through. So um, just for a few takeaways, hopefully we gathered that identifying the main point of the data set that you're trying to communicate is just that essential piece before starting to figure out what chart or graph type you're going to use. And then going from there to select an appropriate chart or graph type. And again, that might mean group conversation, that might mean showing someone and asking if they understand what you're trying to communicate with the chart or graph. And then at the end, we just put utilizing resources to continue learning. I think in the research unit, it, we just kept wanting to learn about it. And one thing that has continued on is anytime we've come across different data visualizations, we will send them to each other just to look at. Because it really does help. I think the more that you continue to look at them and read them and understand them, it helps you get an idea of maybe what charts or graphs work, um, maybe what some ideas are for representing. I know that's um, something we've had fun doing. Um, so some resources that we don't have all of them listed as far as the websites up here for resources, but if you were to use a search engine, um, you should be able to come across some of these. In the research unit, um, Stephanie Evergreen, um, if anyone has, has heard of her, she's a fairly well-known data visualization expert. Um, we've um, utilized resources from Evergreen Data, which is a website and a few books. Also, lynda.com might be. Oh, in the chart chooser cards, which we have up here under other, um, and we hopefully gave you that website earlier on. Those are Stephanie Evergreen. Yeah. And um, so there's a couple other websites up there. A few things we didn't talk about in this session today, I just wanted to point out. Um, color choice and accessibility obviously are some important elements for data visualization, especially if it's going to be presented in an electronic form um, on a website or part of a PDF, because contrast and color is important for accessibility. Also, font size and font type can be an important element for people to be able to read that. And so some accessibility resources I listed up here are ones you can, again, I know I put the acronyms up here, but should turn up in a search engine for you. Um, so, and to wrap up, um, Marilyn's going to wrap us up and we'll talk to you about the bonus resource, <laughs> which we listed up here that she brought. So um, one of the things that is, uh, is related to what we were talking about today is something that we created uh, last year called our Report Reader Checklist. Um, and one of, our, one of the things that we're focused on in the research unit is, uh, again, this kind of uh, research literacy piece. Um, and what we noticed, particularly in some of the reports that we saw out in, in the online education realm, um, is that you know some of the, the ways in which data was represented and written about um, was uh, better than others, <laughs> let's put it that way. And so what we did is create a checklist, and I have a card here with a web link to it so you can download it. We created a checklist so that you could look at a report and go through the checklist to kind of see 
how rigorous and how thorough the particular report was. And so this goes beyond data visualization. Data visualization is a piece of that. But this is a way for you to sit down and say, hey, is this a uh, report that contains elements that I would consider to be um, you know, rigorous, um, thorough, uh, and you know, evaluate some of the things that are published out there uh, to really understand, um, you know, is this solid data that I can make decisions from? Okay. So I encourage you to take a look at it. We've got a, uh, a website for it, and basically it talks about the different categories of the checklist. We give you resources within that checklist, so you can um, understand a little bit more about what you're doing. And then we also have a companion piece to that. If you are a report writer, anybody here a report writer? Yeah, we have a companion piece that actually gives you tips to make a better report. Uh, so those things go hand in hand. So you can find both um, at this particular site here. So Oregon State.edu, ecampus.oregonstate.edu checklist. And again, I've got little cards here for, for those if you're interested in that. So it's related. Data visualization is a piece of an effective report. Okay, and I'm going to quickly do, yep. So, yeah, so here's our contact information at the research unit. Um, you can find us on uh, Twitter and as we mentioned, the podcast. Uh, please stop up here at the end because we've got swag, a <laughs> uh, podcast swag. I mentioned our database earlier, we've got a card for that too. So if you're interested in that, we have cards about our books. And then let's go to the last slide. I'm going to take a moment here to advertise one thing that we've got coming up. Um, this is our, uh, our new program that we have just begun called our seminars program, the Online Teaching and Learning Research Seminars Program. And this is a program that we are bringing groups of researchers to campus um, for three summers. Um, so this is something if you're interested in applying for, go ahead and, and uh, follow that link. Um, this year, our seminar is going to be on meta-analysis, and so we are looking for applicants who have some background in statistics and research methods, uh, specifically meta-analysis, and we bring a group of uh, people from around the country together. They meet uh, three summers in a row and try to do collaborative projects. Our first cohort just met this summer, uh, and people from nine different universities, and we're doing one big study together. So we're really excited about this project. So if you have a specific interest in that, let me know. I can talk to you more about it. Otherwise, that's the link where you can uh, see our past cohort um, and read about the seminar and read about the details. So that's uh, coming up at the patient review. And that's it. So now we have time for questions, right? Do we? Are we out of time? Oh, we have a few few minutes for questions. Questions, comments, thoughts, discussions? Uh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Other comments, thoughts, questions? Do you have a favorite tool for creating? Yeah, that's a great point. So we have been through the Stephanie Evergreen's um, Academy, uh, and she we do all of our stuff in Excel. And her video tutorials, and some of them are free, so go ahead and look at those if you're interested. <coughs> her video tutorials began with doing most of this in Excel, and we do all of our work in Excel. She has just recently, in the last year, released tutorials for R, and I think Python, is it Python or something? There's another one in there. I don't remember what the other one is. Anyway, what was it? No. And it's, it's escaping me at the moment. But anyway, um, she's branched out to tutorials about how to make some of these chart types and some of those other software packages. But I love the fact that most of this stuff can be done with Excel. So I encourage you to take a look at, at doing this. It takes a little bit of training, um, but it's been really effective for us. And it's practical for you know, less people have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Data visualizations in your unit often take the format of um, charts and graphs, or do you also incorporate those things into larger infographics that you put in your Most of our data visualizations um, show up in our PowerPoints, in our reports, for example, and in our website. So if you go actually look at um, our website, you can see some of our national studies 
have kind of landing pages and regrets from being in the organization. You have one that's animated that you can see the mm-hmm. um, And so that those are mostly where you see our data uh, presentations that you go not so much in print. Occasionally in print mm-hmm. material. Poster, occasionally. Posters, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, as Amy mentioned, it's, it's funny because, you know, probably 75% of the time we find some horrible data, and you're like, oh, this is terrible. Mm-hmm. I mean, just a few years ago, we were creating terrible ones. So, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of judgment? <laughs> then, then we'll see a really good one. Like, wow. <laughs> so, you know, once you start noticing the things, you know, the change in your your approach. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I've seen it because I do the right speech. I have no idea when I'm going to start. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. They can't do any work with the charts. Right, and so, that, and so that's where the simpler is the better, right? That's where we have to use these tools to be able to, to show, hey, this is what I want you to get out of it. Mm-hmm. And that Stephanie Evergreen and her tutorials are very much clear about, um, you know, putting titles and things that are very, very clear about, here's what I want you to get from this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that is, and that's a literacy piece, and that's, you know, we're all about that, right? It's really key to literacy and all of these things. And I don't know if any of you saw the, the Chronicle, I think this week, earlier this week there was an article about, in the Chronicle of Higher Education, that we all should be data people, did you see that article? And I'm curious if you take a look at that, I don't remember the author of it, but I think it was Monday that that came out, and it was pretty popular on the Chronicle website, and basically saying, you know, all of us in higher ed, regardless of whether we have statistics backgrounds, whatever, we all need to be uh, understanding data and using data. And it was really exciting because this is what we do on the research panel. We're trying to say this exact same thing, that you, know, you don't have to have a uh, degree in statistics to be a data person. And, that, and part of what we're trying to do is you know, let's use data effectively. Part of what we talk about with our, our checklist is let's be critical about the data that's out there. Um, that's all part of that piece because we need to really use data effectively to move forward. Yeah. So the next one is adding the certifications that you can have a couple of years ago they added uh part of the charts and graphs. Oh and good. And it really did not do well. Yeah. yeah. And I felt it's interesting when they have the literacy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That is interesting. Good to know. Thank you, Good. Cool. Yep, we have about four minutes till session closes, so we'll leave it at that. Thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you. Come on up and grab some things. So, did somebody come by and like turn my lights on? Like, get night time. Oh, we'll take the card pass back. All right. interested in talking more about what you do. Yeah, that's great. A data person in a non-data person area. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> um, so yeah, I know what that's like. Trying to communicate yeah. the why and the how to people who don't think in that way is really interesting. So I teach, we struggle with that. <laughs> yeah, I teach a lot of the data classes in my area. So I'm a professor of communication. Okay. I teach communication research methods and data visualization, mm-hmm. and then I'm also 
our department assessment coordinator and on our university assessment team where we're trying to look at you know department level data and university level data for the slides. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it seems Great. like the work that you're doing is kind of along those lines yeah. too. Yeah. And that's what, you know, research. And one of the things we did is once we went through the Stephanie Evergreen's Academy, we said, okay, we need to open this up. Mm -hmm. And so now we have we run little sessions so that people can come from our all of the campus mm -hmm. to learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. Our marketing folks are learning how to do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, people, yeah, our instructional designers, people in student success are coming to to learn oh, yeah. stuff, and so it's become a thing for our entire eCampus organization mm -hmm. to do this. So it's been really exciting. Yeah, definitely. and you know we're well, we lost Amy, but we were a unit of four, um, you know, in a, a, a organization of a hundred, and so I totally know what that's like. Mm -hmm. It's like you know. It's, that we're trying to raise that awareness that yeah, you get paid into this mm -hmm. and you need to know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And parts of our organization get it. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, get, they're getting it. They're yeah. getting there. Yeah. So. And it's great to have a <laughs> section <laughs> in the department on campus <laughs> that's really fueling mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I feel like at my institutions, I'm at George Fox University, mm -hmm. a small mm -hmm. Christian liberal arts college, yeah. and we're so focused on student experience yeah. that we're a little bit removed from the data yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. And getting people to care about that part yeah. and focus on that. Yeah. Part. Did you see that chronicle? Yes. Yeah. It's great. I sent it to my provost. Yeah. I was like, read this one. It's amazing. Yeah. Yes. So it was great. But yeah. I'm really interested yeah. in learning more about your We're seminar. Yeah. And learning awesome. More about we'll take a look. Yeah. Great. So thank yeah. you so much. All right. What was your name? Courtney. Courtney. Good to meet you, Courtney. We're nearby. Yeah, yeah I have a business card somewhere. Yeah. So do you know where the lights are out here in front? Do you know why the lights are out in the front? They were, on and they were on and then they just mysteriously went off. <laughs> I can get a call to someone that might know a little bit better than me. Okay. Yeah. Well, good to meet you. Yeah, yeah that would be too. great. Yeah. yeah. It would be Love nice to it would be nice to talk yeah. things. Tips so. and tricks too. Okay. Of like creating a movement <laughs> of some sort without resources to create that movement. So yeah. How you start yeah. from the ground up. Yeah. Yeah, and our unit's been around for about five years now, so. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So Thank you so much young. again. Thank you. Thank you. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. All right. Okay, what do we have left to take to back up this little stack? Yeah, that should probably be just pretty good. Yeah. So I'm going to put them in the patch. Well, I'll just give it a little bit at yeah. this point, right? And then she can put this there. She doesn't need these. I will keep these. i got to eject this. How do I eject? I don't know how to even eject. i got to go back here, don't I? Yeah, oh, there we go. Oh, down here, yeah. yeah I, so I don't use yeah. a, a PC anymore, so I've lost my Very ability nice. to do it. Oh, okay. You gotta close that. Gotta close this completely. Yeah. Ta da! So lovely. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, she doesn't need chart choosers. Oh, the lovely setup. Yeah. I know. I, yeah. It, well, and I hope they could hear us since we yeah. were moving all around. I don't know how well it recorded. Well, they never complained in my case. I'm not they didn't learn much. Oh, okay. Oh, perfect. And it was fine. Are you presenting next here? Oh, good. All right, we're out of your way. Oh, I'm going to put this away first. You know what, I'll just stick it in here. We'll be fine here. Okay. okay. Actually, I was going to put that coat away, wasn't I? Okay, good luck with your section. Thank you. Yeah, that section mine, I'll put that.
Are you staying for my session? I am. Oh, I better make sure it's good. <laughs> Probably shouldn't tell you I finished it this morning. First part of our presentation for background and public. This has to be the coldest room. I'm just saying it's much cooler in here than this room. I guess I reflect my personality. <laughs> <laughs> it was warm when I came in earlier. I, I know, and then I came in. <laughs> well, we got our lights off and
I think it's 1050. Do you think it's 1050? Okay. <coughs> then I'm going to go ahead and get started. So my name is Velda. Probably most of you will that this morning when I did the show. I'm from Blue Mountain Community College. And I've been an OER advocate since about 2004. So uh, I originally started at Lane Community College in Eugene. Uh, for the last five years, I've been at Blue Mountain Community College in Hamilton. So I'll give you an overview of what you can expect. This is my least favorite slide. Um, so first I'm going to talk about history of OERs because it's a fairly short history and I think that's important. Uh, benefits for students, benefits for faculty, and there'll be a time at the end for questions. But I would encourage you to ask questions at any time because I can go off on side trails and come back. I'm good at that. So, and I, yeah, I just won't go on that. So history of OERs, it started in uh, 1994 when they created Merlot. Is anybody familiar with Merlot? Okay. Uh, they started uh, grabbing free content and categorizing it and putting it into a catalog so you can sort through it and find things. Then in 1998, David Wiley started uh, with the idea of open content and he said there should be some kind of licensing so when you see something, you know what you're allowed to do with it. Okay, what, what does it mean? Then in 99, um, I started Connections, which became OpenStax. You guys familiar with OpenStax? Okay. Uh, so that was pretty pretty fast movement. 2001, there was this huge influx of money to MIT, $11 million for them to put their coursework. They did videos, they recorded it, and they put everything free online. That's great, exciting for people. I teach at a community college. That wasn't very exciting for me because most of that was past community college, right? So then um, Creative Commons was also started that year and that's with the license, the open content licensing. Uh, the very next year MIT started sharing their software or their courses uh, through open courseware. Okay, so that was again a uh, categorizing management kind of way to deal with all of that content. <clears throat> also in 2002, UNESCO held the first conference. It was a global conference. And that, according to the, what I could find, was the first time open educational resources was used. So I, I used to say I've been using open educational resources since before that term was around. Um, it's pretty close. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, then in 2005, uh, they created a, a community wiki, which wikis now are way out of date, but that was a big deal at the time. Um, so in 2010, Millennial Associates, anybody ever heard of that? Probably not. You've heard of it, Bruce? Millennial Associates? No? That was Jeremy Reel at Lane Community College and me and a bunch of other people. Uh, so now it's all about me. Uh, we were asked, so uh, are you familiar with Lane Community College where it's located? Pretty radical students there. So students were upset about the high cost of textbooks and they'd heard about what MIT had been doing. And they said, we want to know if there is open content, free open content for community college students. So student government uh, paid for us to do the research and we went out we did all this research and we found that there was not a lot of content for community colleges. And so we, we listed, started, I started sort of catalog cataloging all of the open content that's out there and um, by categories, you know, so if I teach business, so what's there for business, you know, what's there for math, that kind of thing. And then that same year, I got involved, and I just realized this this morning when I was finishing my presentation, I got involved with Merlot. And they were so thrilled because we were the first community college to work with them. And so they finally were getting uh, community college level coursework in their catalog system. And they uh, invited me to present in 2011. So it says there was a community college person, that was actually me, and I presented there. And the university people, I remember, it was all university people except for me, the one community college person. 
And they, they said, well, how could you use that at a community college? And I thought, well, you teach 100 and 200 level courses. It's like the same thing. Um, but anyway, that was kind of exciting. And then in 2012, Washington passed their legislation for OER development. And that was huge. I remember when their first, I think it was 42 courses, went out and was it Angel? Was that the software that they were using? I remember the, the LMS was unfamiliar to me. Uh, I went out there and started looking at all their courses and I thought this is just exciting uh, because th there are people now developing OERs for community college students. So, and now in case you didn't know, uh, this is all the way down to K-12. So it, it's just grown. So, any questions on the history? Because this is the end of history. I stopped in 2012. So I want to tell you the reason I got into OERs uh, was about 2004. I'd been laid off in 2002 at Lane. I came back in 2004 and they gave me this course. And it was team building. And they had a hardcover book that they used five chapters. I said, why are you going to make team five a hardcover book? And use five chapters. And this is about team building, which I already know how to do. I don't need a book. So I created my own resources. Back at that time, you got a packet at the bookstore. So you had to get it in how many weeks before the term started to the bookstore so they could put it in plastic so they could sell it to the students. So I taught that class all term. If any of you have ever created content, you know you learn and you change things. So I created a new packet for winter term. And then I changed them around and back at the spring term. But you can do that, right? So there I am, the second week of class, referring to something in the class packet, and I realized I have three different packets in this classroom because they got them from their friends. Now I can remember what I've done between winter and spring. But I certainly didn't remember what had changed between fall and spring. So that's when I took my content. I had a website, and I just put my content out on the website when we were using FCT at the time. And I just linked to that. Make sure you're reading it's on the web. Everyone's looking to the same thing. Um, and I didn't know that was innovative. It just made sense to me uh, to do that. So. so what are the benefits for students? So this morning I gave you some data uh, about costs and those kind of things. But first I want to look at some of the data. So these are the ones that I shared with you earlier this morning with my trailer. Uh, do you have students that don't buy textbooks? What does that mean for their learning? To be fair, I have students that have OERs that have content and still don't read it. Uh, I had a student just last week when I said, this is not what you were supposed to do. Please refer to the reading. She goes, oh, well, maybe I'll start doing the reading before you time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's only week three. OK. Um, so and students skipping courses or pushing them off till later because they can't afford that textbook. So I have to admit, for a long time, I teach business, we have had this keyboarding class, this document processing class. We use Greg Desk very much, right? Greg Document Processing, an online program to do their keyboarding. They have to have an access group, but they're not going to be giving it an access code. <laughs> right. So hard book, hardcover book, online access code that expires, uh, and so students would often, and our uh, keyboarding class is only six weeks long, so the student starts, doesn't have the materials, well I'm going to order it, so they order it from, know, from someplace, they finally get it week three, remember it's a six week course, uh, the access code has expired, so then they have to get the access to it. It's just not helpful for students at all uh, to get through that. And I know Bruce has always loved that access to it. This last summer I took those courses with three of them. I made them all OER. So there's free online keyboard and stuff to teach you how to keyboard. It's why every next student pay $100. Or if a student fails keyboarding, believe it or not, uh, or doesn't complete it, and then they wait for over a year for the access to their credit. So, and there are a lot like AMP, that's an expensive textbook, and then we have physiology, uh, that's an OER class now. So, OERs help you get away from that. 
And then the whole thing about saving money. Did we save two million just in two years? Yeah, we we started building ours in 2012. Yeah, we started in nine, but then officially called. We were open five million, and Brad thinks about eighteen hundred for a small community college. Yeah. But uh, our our goal there is to actually have a degree. Yeah, trans, you know, or to transfer degree to be able to totally open, following the model that we're doing and actually get with uh, starting with Tidewater Community College. And they went from one few college in Virginia to 23 years in Virginia. So we're real close. Um, business was my first one in developing business and moving in business. Yeah. But we just rolled Econ, which is worth uh, another $176 to $200 textbook for micro. Then we did macro in the winter. That was, most of us would not buy. One thing that I've never warned you, you start talking about going on in our community. It's your bookstore, it's going to go to the administration and say, Bruce is making us lose money. You're trying to put the bookstore out of business, no, we're not. It's a model that should change when all the artists are going to have to do that. And we're having that discussion here, we're talking about how college is going to have to do that. We did get a piece of that, that we were. Oh yeah, well yeah. I need to share this with her. Say, so, yeah, look. Um, so bundling with the CDs. This is one thing that made me angry years ago when they would update CDs in the books. So you'd have to buy the whole new thing. Uh, customized editions. That's where, and I think publishers were really clever to say, oh, well, you don't need the whole book. Which chapters do you like? We'll just take those out and make your own book. Try and resell that book. So, and. Uh, you're probably all familiar with the student public interest research groups, the PERGs, uh, that they did a study and textbook costs rose 73% in 10 years, four times the cost of living, the rate of inflation. Um, they looked at uh, another report, PERG report, that textbooks were 26% of university tuition and 72% of community college tuition. So that's insane, right? So uh, research proved that it didn't harm students' learning, and generally, students did better. So how many of you uh, teach and use OERs? Would you say that's right? Do students do better? Yeah. So the benefits, of course, there's cost. We've talked to that. Um, I find that links to the online, I link up to a lot of online things. I do assessments, I teach a leadership, so I do some assessments. Uh, and students like that, because they're going out there and they're learning things, and it's not just one source of information. It's coming from different places. And depending on what you find out there, you know, I don't take cat videos in my classes, but you can find some really interesting things. Like, uh, I teach social intelligence, and so I'm linking to things that where you have people that aren't using social intelligence. <laughs> uh, it's quite eye-opening for them. Or emotional intelligence, they teach that too. Uh, there's opportunity for them to discover things and to learn on their own. I'm surprised the younger generation can use all of this technology, but they don't seem very 
skilled with researching online. Uh, we just had a, a SWOT analysis activity in one of my classes, and the student said, would you give me examples? Well, in the reading, there are examples, and there are links to other examples. And I'm thinking, you really want me to Google more examples for you? Um, <clears throat> and so this is helping them improve their digital literacy, too, to get out there and to experience. Oh, I have, I have projects. I don't do tests. I give students projects. And I'll say, like, just uh, hospitality and tourism. Here are the top 10 hoteliers. Who would you ask this list? Well, of course, I would go out there because I give them all. Right? Go out there and find somebody else who should be in the top 10 list and why. Fun for me. I don't know why. Um, and they can have access to the materials after the course. And that's what I found to be uh, the most beneficial. I've had students come up to me years. I've had students at the who who have been touching me and say, you know that course you had on this? I just used that. Like, I added this to my work. Uh, improving my resume. Uh, they things like that. So um, I'm going to give you a little bit of 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 I think the projects. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, we're going to get there just for students. Okay, Okay. <laughs> 
I don't really get my report cards on the internet. So um, I wanted to include this. Do you have any students that cheat and copy from the web? <laughs> So I like to share with them what OERs are and what the different uh, licenses say you can do with them. And point out to them that this does not mean you can get copyrighted books from the same way. Okay? So um, I think it's important for them to, to understand that. So when we say uh, that you have this access for, you have this resource for life, sure, but what can you do with it? You can't sell it probably, depending on licensing. Uh, you can mix it, reuse it, do all these things. So I think teaching them those skills <laughs> to not share what you're not allowed to share is really important. And I have, so you notice I do have uh, citations here. I have all of those in this slide deck. So you'll get the citations too with URLs. Okay, so benefits for faculty. So this Hilton did, uh, looked at 16 studies. And remember OERs, the reason that I did the short history of the community is they aren't that old. So it has studies, it's not a whole lot of data. So he found that in the 16 studies, there was only one that said students performed less with OERs, uh, but most of them said they higher test scores, lower dropout rate, lower failure. Uh, most of the students in the studies said that they were superior to textbooks. Half said they were equivalent, and a few said they were inferior. So with this one, if this is a first time student to college, how would they know if they hadn't had a textbook? I mean, I think the only way you can really compare that is to say, oh, I took this class with a textbook and this class with an OER. And I don't know many students who do that. Um, good as, if not better, than traditional textbooks. And the limitations that he saw. So most of these had small sample sizes. I know somebody in, somebody in Oregon just did, I can't remember where this person is from. I think it's from Southwestern Oregon Community College, uh, on the courses that they taught there. And they had small sample sizes. So what does that say? Uh, different modalities. Is it a face-to-face -face course? Is it an online course? Is it a hybrid? How do you compare those? And what if they have different instructors? You know, are, are the instructors more engaging in a face-to-face -face course than they are in an online course? So those were some of the limitations that he found. So benefits, cost savings. So I say it's a cost savings for faculty too because I don't have to go out there and look around for choose which textbook I want to use. Uh, and I haven't done that for decades now. But I know my colleagues, say for accounting, when you're going to teach the principal sequence to go out and compare all the publishers who has the best accounting book for you to use, along with the online instructor, along with the instructor resources. Yeah. That's why I work a lot of time to do that. Uh, less hassle than working with publishers. I put that on here because I don't know how to, I think maybe you get pressured by publishers. I used to say we were, we were suckled by publishers, but they gave us, here's your course, here's your PowerPoint, here's your test space, here's everything you need. Um, that might be something they don't buy, but I have everything. I don't have to make anything else. Um, and publishers don't seem to like me very much. Because I say, oh, well, we have a textbook. It's under 50 bucks. No. Uh, do you have text? Do you have textbooks in each project? No. Does anyone know why I use projects instead of us? Yeah. Students told me when I was at Miami years ago that they learned more from projects than they learned from us. They studied the text. They never studied the project. Yeah. 
OARs, you can emphasize current research, what's going on currently. So with that HR management course, the first term I taught it was a 200 plus dollar textbook. I was working two chapters ahead of the students to make sure that the URLs were correct. And so in our learning management system every week, I said, use this URL for this page, use this URL for that page. Uh, so how do you make sure that what you're using is the most current and using the current research? I know some textbooks, they talk about things that happened in you know, the 1990s. Is that relevant now? Is there something newer you could bring in? So my colleague teaches an interior business computing course. She's so got Excel, Access, PowerPoint, Word. <coughs> she is always, and she's involved in the cattle industry, so she's always looking for data, and she'll find some new data. Like you know, what are the top tag production this year? She could take that and replace what she has that was last year with the new data. Uh, and so she's always doing that. So I think it's pretty cool. And you get less cheaters that way. Because I can't take that that assignment to make in last year. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, flexible and customizable. So you can decide how you move things around. And you don't have to wait for a bookstore to create a packet or whatever. Um, and I decide, well, I'm going to do this term because I want to. I can. Circulation turnaround time? Fast. I mean, wherever you keep your stuff, absolutely. Right there. So when we started with OERs, it was pretty much just content. Okay, so I had all this content. And how do you assess? Well, I would make up projects. I would make up tests. I mean, I have done tests. Uh, but now people are creating all these things. So they're creating flag apps. They're creating test banks. Uh, they're coming up with activities. So, and um, we just had a round of grants in Oregon um, for OERs, and a lot of those were for the ancillaries. Okay? To add value for it. The students. And uh, some people have been doing videos, which I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I don't personally like to do videos because then I think every year I've got to update them because we're American every year, so you never know what's going to do. Do you guys do you make your own uh, resources or do you, are you out there looking for resources? No? Both. Both? Mm -hmm. Do you like that? That's a question for me. Do my students like it? Uh, <laughs> well, if you don't like it, they're not going to like it. Well, so my goal is effectiveness. Okay. Uh, I, want, I want to find something that's effective. It's either I find it or I make it. Okay. Well, if I find a resource and I'm excited about it, I can tell you they're going to be excited about it. So I've been working on the hospitality and tourism course. We're in week four. I've got three week five. Uh, so I'm going to be two weeks ahead of that. And I find things, and I can tell you when I put them in there, whatever I 
Can I fix that work? You know, if it's a video, and I say, why the video was created, and part of my story, that is the way I introduce it, it's like that. So, I had one student who was in a career in my courses, or small school, uh, had this assignment, and she's writing in all this stuff. Uh, and I'm like, oh, she's got the ball. She's supposed to write about a fuzzy goal, so I can help her get it into a smart goal format for her. But she's writing about the research she did in the other course, the hospitality course, of course. And I'm just like, oh, I don't have to do that. It's really good. I don't even have to take off point, because it's really hard to do that fuzzy goal. Her very last sentence is, thank you for helping me figure out my fuzzy goal. So she had she had just that week with the, the two classes to get out of the goal. And what it was was what career she wanted to go into. And she wasn't going to do that energy. Because I had them out researching occupations in hospitality and tourism industry. Yeah. Something that they're a skill that they can use forever. So, <coughs> so Another benefit is you could have, and Bruce mentioned this a bit, entire courses. So when we started, I got some content here and some over there and put them all together. Anybody use these women? I don't. I don't think. No, I don't. I look at it a lot. It's an entire course. It comes usually for a semester, and since we're term, you have to take something out. <laughs> your students kill you. Uh, <laughs> Because <laughs> you try to give them 16 works with the stuff in 10. Uh, all of the, it comes with videos, it comes with learning outcomes, it comes with uh, test bags, pre test, post test, everything you could want. And my colleague Ron, he uses women. He goes in, if he doesn't like the video, he swaps it out. Okay, he can do that. It's pretty exciting that you get this whole thing ready to go. <coughs> Another one is Merlot. Build up. A lot of these build up all their stacks, text books, they use Merlot stack kind of thing, and they're doing a lot of stuff in stacks, so they adopt and hope they put their stacks, and then they do not put them in the video. And the biggest thing with women is that they have an instructor who never been open. He's a bridge from my lab, books in, and he's a good mic technology, so you do not want to walk this close to him to do a text board or something like that. So the last thing I want to do is I'll try to make sure that I'm moving into a platform with um, that work. Yeah. If you move into that, I'm still be teaching my labs and the bar, I love looking after something Well, it does have some pressure from this department. So there's also Open Oregon. Those of you in Oregon, I hope you know about that. There's uh, Open Washington. I tried to find an open Idaho. I couldn't find one. Anyone here from Idaho? Is there a state group? I tried. I couldn't find. Oh, well, don't search open Idaho. I found a lot of really bizarre things. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't OER related. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Canvas Commons, which that's where I'm putting my stuff. OER Commons. And then I, I mentioned that the trailer that Amazon is working on K-12. So I'm not sure what that's going to look like. It's kind of a little scary. Well, I think it's scary. That Amazon will be getting into education. Well, no, I guess it makes sense, right? Um, but yeah, it will be interesting to see what they do with all of that. Um, and, and yeah, that it's K-12. So any other benefits? So you, you wanted to talk about benefits. Did I hit them, or do you have oh, something? You have, yeah, you have um, just to customize it for, you know, turn to turn. What's the difference? Oh, yeah, and so in my, uh, I used Canvas, so I have an instructor notes in there. So as I go along and something works, it doesn't work, I'll put it in there. Make sure next time you choose both, because that will be done. Uh, usually things don't work. Right? So I make sure I change the new records. So one thing I forgot to put up there, I missed, so I went to community college. Community college is supposed to do a lot of research. Yeah, that's not a good thing. So in this way, it sort of satisfies my need for research, because I'm not there always looking for what's new. So I subscribe to newsletters and blogs and all these things, so I'm keeping it up with whatever. I'll have to tell you what's going on. Uh, 
uh, being out in the field and touring the speed. Um, I'm also involved with the Chamber of Commerce, too involved, probably. I'll be the president in the Chamber. Uh, I'm not imagining that. But, so I know a lot of the reasons why they created the videos and why they have like the uh, uh, governor's conference on tourism is there in 2016, what the impact was, and what the impact of my life on the community and the local people see it, brings in like one million seventeen million dollars. So that's insane. Uh, they have things like pricing, like uh, business tax. All these things are bringing in a lot of money to the community. And so why is why the story not? Hmm. And that benefit the hospitality industry. So all those people need places to sleep and places to sleep. Okay, so challenges to remember. <coughs> and this looks like a this looks like a really scary list. And you all need to ask a lot more questions because it's almost eleven thirty and I'm almost done. Uh, <laughs> yes.
wanted to learn how to do it better. So quality, what you use, how do you know if it's quality, if it's high quality? You don't just take something out there and say, oh, it's on the web, so it's good. 
right? We have to make sure what we need to use for. Because our students will take whatever. We're, we're experts. If we say this is what it is, they will do this. Uh, reliability and sustainability. I told you I'd put a lot of my stuff on the web, on my personal web page. So when I retire from the near future, is that all going to go And do I maintain it to the point? Okay. Think about that. What, you, what you're using, so if you're just referring to my website, which I don't know. Think about that. Are you copying that? Putting that? I, I have a picture you can copy and we can share and you can do all that. Are you doing that? Or are you just putting on the list forever and keep it up to date? Uh, inconsistency in materials. This is one uh, that came up in Kelly's research. Because if I am using stuff from here and stuff from there, our students going to be confused because it's not consistent. I don't know if that's a problem or not. Or if that's a good thing. I don't, when I'm not using it directly, I don't accept it the whole way. The whole updating is it to be updated? Hopefully it is. Um, <coughs> accessibility, we have a student, we have blind student, I believe, we have deaf students. Uh, how do they get their materials in the way that they need? So I used to have, well, I still do, <laughs> courses where I would record them in my room and then post them. So for my deaf students, it took me two weeks to get it uh, post happy. At least. <laughs> no, she, you can see people are aware of it. And a lot of times they're not aware of it. That's the biggest problem. We're going to decide what do I do when I'm going to come to this and that rest of it. Especially when you're dealing with the educational resources. Um, so accessibility is at least I do not see it's hard in the last year and a half. We got also our kids by the department of the for our side, so we don't understand that is I'm not allowed to talk about it. Regular to communications and online courses. They never looked at accessibility. They didn't care about they were more worried about are you wearing the correspondence course? Right. Or, or having the having the subconscious. Accessibility is sort of addressed at that point. Yeah. They're going to come here to the point. But we have to, you know, you see, all you can do is have compassion. And then um, and try to be proactive with that. Mm -hmm. And for the, the, the OER side of it, um, I'm going to try to be more involved because of accessibility. Person was brand new, like going into the fire. We had to be aware of it. Then we assumed that the student could do chapter one using JAWS, the map and map. Um, and you know, it could be a textbook in the map. Oh, Anna will jump all over that. JAWS, <laughs> JAWS was not, not, um, be working. And no one in the end told me that. They didn't even tell the instructor that JAWS was working and seeing that. So accessibility has gotten used, and with the OER, if you don't know where most of it's PDFs. Right, if you have a PDF, it's a limit. Yeah, so PDFs is always, first thing you look at in the course, it's a limit. You got a free book, it's a PDF download. AMD, 2,500 pages. Download 2,500 pages. <laughs> <laughs> On a 3G phone, you know, which brings me to the next one, which is technology. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. what technology do they need to use it for? And students have smartphones, and some students have a 
The thing I learned is students do good problems a lot. The last fall, I think it was, a student's first week would take a quiz, which is a lot of classes. And then they said, so I took this quiz and it didn't do very well. Was it a reason? <laughs> because if they're just using it on the phone and using the app, they see the due date. So they say, OK, I have something to do. I don't put something out there that says, here's an assignment, go read this. Right? I mean, that seems obvious. So they're just going to work on the calendar, clicking that and doing it. And they can go up and go, you know, I'm sending an email that says, how to work with some money and what about it? Oh, we're supposed to read that email? Yeah. So technology is a huge one. <laughs> Audio, video. Uh, we are in Eastern Oregon. We do have a group of people that have dialogue. We still have people with dialogue. Or is that the line? They call it 3G ESL. Okay. It's not ESL. It's 3G. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 So technology is a thing. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we do that we want to do on the phone. Just really good. Yeah. Uh, licensing. That's the other thing. Yes. Yeah. 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 Where are doing OERs, it's our responsibility to adhere to the license of the material that we have. How do we know if that looks like? So here's the little flat world. You could use pay for a book, or you could use their PDF stuff for free. And I believe it was 2012 that they decided no, and I thought it was an amazing model. What kind of model? How are people going to make money? Because you can have it for free, everything, when you get paid for free. So I'll make you ask for money. So they got rid of it for free. Well, I think it was a good one that somebody, somebody downloaded all of their stuff. Yeah, what's the thing? Are you talking about sales? Sales? No, something like that. Large bar. 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 <laughs> uh, but Sailor took those, and so they took those and then they pulled it up. So that, when you look at that licensee, is that, is that allowed? It was free in 2012, 2015. Well, licensee is free. <laughs> right. But if you use the one from my bucket, you can use the years and years and make all of that. But if you take something to flat and work up to that, not necessarily so. So if you are using something that has licensing that references flat world, I don't know, in the year it's not really protected. That's something that's easy to mention. If somebody sends this photo, but it's not, you know, <laughs> are you sure you're, you're keeping track of your resources, saying your resources are up? And that you're following the licensing of the you can't really go out and move on to the lack of track licensing from the court, so it's not going to do that. Uh, but make sure that you're fair with your licensing. Yeah. So, and like I said, that's a great thing to teach students. Yeah. And that supports the wisdom that if we are, those of us who are grabbing content and throwing it into our course, so I don't care what. I do care about the updates that I'm working on. I, I care that I have a copy of a version that works for the assignment that I have working here, and I document where I got that. Right. So you, you bring the documentation with the product that you, you're describing. It doesn't matter what the document is, it's the source that you, you use. Yes. Whether it's a picture or, or, or web content, it's where you got it, because whatever changes occur later, I, I'm not even going to track that. Right. But because of the legality, I don't care. I've got my source, and at this time, it was a. And if I said it's free to use, right. the next whatever. Correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, any questions? So I do. So I will. Uh, this will whole thing will be available. But I told you I did have my references here. So. Okay. So I, I am tracking on, on something. I'm working with some people and, and design, and we we stumbled across the topic just because we have some time. Uh, I'll right. other people ask questions, but um, I, I'm really impressed with your history and the things that you've been involved with. 
And so my question for you is for the future. What what can we anticipate? What do we have any clues as to what the next big so in the context of online instruction and, and OERs and Amazon's doing K twelve and is twenty years from now is everything gonna be free? Is is it because we, when we first started this, they were talking about people around the world. So again, it goes back to my time zone. Uh, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Right. If, if somebody has something good, I'll grab their main piece and then I'll add and adjust. But the first thing that came out is that soon any student can access any teacher anywhere in the world. And the people that are going to make money or produce the best results are those who have the best skills at doing that. And, and so we're, we're going to have these pathways that it's no longer it used to be the factories for education. You had to go to the school. You had to interact with the expert on the stage. And now we're saying that expert could be anywhere on the planet and, and producing content that's the best content on the planet. And anybody can come in to access that from anywhere else. So we don't have to Outside of that university, creates that same assessment tool that can document I have those skills, or employers have the assessment tool. It would it's about the competency, employer. not the course. Right, I agree. Right. But if the employers are still going to say I need a bachelor's degree, I'm going to have to find some place to give that to you. So I think that's exactly. <coughs> and I hope others will want to chime in on this. I don't want to get stuck <laughs> down there, but but that's exactly what's happening. Is we have. 20 year olds who are developing applications, making millions of dollars, and don't know anything else about how to run a business or or anything else in the world other than I did this app and now I have money and, and I, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And it gets into the issue of why, why do we have degrees in the set of, you know, these, why do I need a business program when I can go out and I, I know how to make a scheme? No, I, I mean, <laughs> no, but I mean, that's a legitimate. Like, like, um, and feels, you know, um, winners and losers, and, and even the whole concept of open resources, winners and losers, that people aren't um, um, they, uh, that or that they make out uh, the answer to these issues. Uh, but, but I would say, I mean, there's, there's like a workshop later on today, or not workshop, there's a discussion on passion, mm -hmm. and so I'll probably drop in on that one too, and, and that speaks to what we're talking about. I mean, I think we're still a ways away from like a bad being better than a um, degree from Harvard, for example. If you have a degree from Harvard, that kind of something. It would depend on which field, though. Well, it depends on which See, field. I think but just your science going to benefit. Right, but I mean, still, for most fields, I think that's fair to say. If you have a degree from University of uh, Oregon, or Washington, or Harvard, Yale, right, or whatever, like that, that will count higher. Now, but you do have, a, I mean, I think that's a first statement mm -hmm. um, for a lot of employers. But you're right. I mean, you have a lot of people who are 18 to 23 who don't have a reason to end. We, we have the answers we don't, so that's just the question. Well, part of the reason those degrees have value is because you have writing, you have right. math, you have some basic competencies, which just has to be Right. Well, yeah, and so as you have those people who create this app, the older part of there's going to be more, if there's more of them, mm -hmm. there are people who hold the LP, then it might be more than you're right. If they're in a position to power. And boy, well, that'll be a great surprise. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're tired. And that, now I'm going to connect all of the folks here. Uh, Jeff, you're going to be talking about the future of education. So, so there's a whole issue of 
we have to have institutions so I can have an educational career. I'm hired to to educate. And I'm saying, and for me, it's going back to, not Stone Age, but I'm stuck on biblical times, where the sage, uh, if, I'm a, <laughs> right, if I'm a great teacher, people will pay to come and sit before me. Yeah. And so, it, it, and I make it optional. I just create incredible content and for you to access this. You're going to pay what you can, what you want, or anything else. And it doesn't fit in our, our model of education and structure and, and everything else. But I, I'm just, I'm try, I, in my own mind, I'm just trying to leave mess why. Where do you sit, Mom? Yeah, I, I, I have the impression. It's going to, it's going to blow up. It's going to blow up. It's going to be badges. And uh, be, because so many of these kids, so the need will follow money. And if the money, if a kid, people can access money without having to go through our institution or my program or whatever, they're going to go where it's the easiest and most accessible. Yeah, our higher education system is integrated, so the built-up R&D unit and seek time and all that. Look at the trend conference. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, it doesn't want to elaborate. Very good. So we're done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for providing. Well, I'm just saying Facebook's free. That's a huge issue, actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, anyways, there are issues that's going on. Okay. I'm going to. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's awesome. <laughs> well, we're seeing that right now. People with incredible degrees have no jobs. <laughs> Turn that off to set the ball. Oh, cool. Actually, I actually have a presentation in here next. I was just seeing what it looks like. You do? Like. Yeah. Just just seeing, okay. Yeah, I was just seeing what it looks like. Yeah. yeah. The screens would be too small. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm just kind of cheating a little bit to see. Slides look like I've noticed it's in the back, I can't see anything on the screen. Okay, well, that's one of the reasons I left the light on. Oh, that's okay, that's a good idea. Because when it was on, it was kind of hard to see. So you'll put your USB in here, and this changes slides. So you run the PowerPoint, you have PowerPoint? Uh, on the cloud. Okay. Yeah. So this will change slides. Gotcha. And you said you recommended the lights off? Yeah. Okay. Because they couldn't see it. Okay. It's much clearer. Yeah. I know it's cut off a little bit too. But I guess that didn't seem to matter. 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 Okay. Yeah. Very good. Hey, thanks so much. You're welcome. Yeah. making decisions about long-term needs when their 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 prior their priorities are short-term they're staying in office. 
and you have administrators who and, and so I'm saying, we live in this world, we live in this society where you have the, the wrong system so to be involved that way. Right? Oh, and, and I, I, I told them that I go, so Portland is booming right now. I just drove around some areas that I hadn't been before, and there's buildings going up in front of everywhere. And I'm going, people are investing huge amounts of money. And so I go, Decisions. Just like society, it'll follow money. If, if there's money available, people are going to, I'm in. You know, I'm going to build it this way, build it that way, put a ton of whatever it is. And so, so I think education is going to follow the same way that somehow there'll be a system, there'll be technology, there'll be something that guys can If I take what I know and I take what I've done for years and years and years, and this is what I see Velda doing. And, and it's, what I, it's what I'm being for, so I, I'm a career educator, but I'm having to take all my experiences and apply this in new ways and a new environment and with new tools to, to be productive and to be to make a profit. That's what my goal is. And then that's where my meeting stage is. Yeah, I think they're they have very spotty internet. Even on your phone when you connect it, they have spotty yeah. internet. Interesting. <laughs> Although this isn't the first conference I've been to where they had Wi Fi spotty. Oh trust me, yeah. it's common. It's it's really cheese, common. like it works one minute next time, so that's why they asked me a USB. Hmm. Do you have a USB? Uh, my partner said she was bringing one, so hopefully she remembers too. Because yeah, this would take all day. Yeah, yeah, we're at an e-learning conference and can't use a. <laughs> yeah. How did your presentation go? I think it went okay. Yeah, it wasn't very many people. 
How many people do you, sorry, I'm probably late to this whole part of it. How many people do you think are at this conference? 220. Oh, wow. Oh, so there's quite a bit. Yeah. Got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't even ask. I just, but, gotcha. Yeah, it's not. So between six sessions, that's roughly about maybe a little under 40 per session if it's evenly distributed, right? I had like 10. 10? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there are people who come to these and then take off, so. I saw a lot of that in mine. There were probably like five different people came in and out. Yeah. Yeah, cool. you're going to need to find a USB. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, huh? how's it going? Good. Uh, not yet. It's not till two twenty. Oh yeah, it was. It was okay. It wasn't bad. Um, what was I gonna say? Um, yeah, I'm just kind of. I'm in the room where I'm supposed to be gonna practice and see what it looks like. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll it'll be empty till until my presentation. Yeah, so I'm just going to take a look to see what the screen looks The screens are a lot smaller than I thought, so we'll take a look to see what that looks like. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and then you're also going to, um, we're also going to, um, what do you call that? Um, uh, check me in, too. Or, I mean, you need to check in, too, right? Yes, I did. I just need to get the ticket number and everything, yeah. I do. It should be on my app. Oh, I did? Okay, so what do I need to do then? Okay. 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 Yeah. So what, what, so what do I need to do? Do I need to re-enter the number in? So I'll do that then. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Same process. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. Cool. We will. I will do that. So now I'm gonna gonna go through it and fast through this whole thing. Yeah. So I'm gonna. Uh, yeah. 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 I'm just. I'm actually gonna leave here. I'm actually just. Uh, just wanted to, um, yeah, I just wanted to be here, so, yeah, but, yeah, so anyway, um, I will be in contact with you soon. God, she's perfect. I love you. Okay, right, talk to you later, man. I love you, bye.
So this states uh, refers to the ways in which race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, English proficiency, community wealth, familial situations, or other factors contribute to or perpetuate lower educational aspirations, achievement, and attainment for certain groups of students. And typically, the certain groups of students that it's referring to are low income, uh, first generation, uh, non-English speaking, or they might come from economically disadvantaged areas or communities. And so why we prefer the term opportunity gap over the achievement gap is because the achievement gap, which a lot of us are familiar with, that really focuses more on the disparities of academic outcomes in those certain groups of students. And typically, those academic outcomes could be retention rates, uh, but in the most mainstream way, it's looking at test scores. And both of those are very result-oriented, and it puts a lot of responsibility on the student. And so why the opportunity gap, and why you prefer it, and why it's a little bit different, is because we're considering what a student actually has to go through before they step foot on a college campus. And so the best way to think about it is that the opportunity gaps drive the achievement gap, and it's more of a solution-oriented way of thinking. And it also helps us find out what resources we need to create for students and how to make those resources accessible um, so we can position students for success. And that brings us to digital opportunity gaps at Shoreline. So our e-learning services team, we support the general student population, but we also uh, focus mainly on those taking fully online and hybrid courses. And these are some of the gaps that we see that impact the student success. And so the very first two here, um, no internet at home and minimal access to internet. And so that brings us to digital opportunity gaps at Shoreline. So our e-learning services team, we support the entire uh, student population, but we mainly support those who are fully online and taking hybrid courses. And so these are some of the gaps we see that impact the student success. Uh, the ones that are bolded, those are ones that I commonly see because those are ones that can go back. By the way, I might just be talking to myself, just to make sure. <laughs> just to get, get some thoughts out there. So if you hear me talking, that's no, what it is. <laughs> if you're okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, this should be my other work, you do your thing. So the impact of these gaps and continue through our workforce. So what is Smart Measure? It's an online survey that helps students find out if they're ready for an online or technology-rich course. 35 minutes. There are six components to it, and six components are individual attributes, all the way down to typing speed, and the bullet points that you see underneath each um, component, those are the topic questions, and those are just a few of them. I just want to provide some samples of what each component uh, is asking the student. And so for every component, there are questions attached to it, what comes after smart measure, outreach, purpose, budget, tutoring, purpose technology. All right, so let's see.
So session outcomes, initial thoughts on our developing. Or at a glance, so who we are. And then the opportunity gap, basic definition of it, moving on the achievement. So digital gaps of our community supports the general population. Um, how will our main focus is then to fully online or online courses. Um, and so these are gaps that we see that impact to student success on a daily basis. And the gaps that are involved are one that I see. So the gaps are involved from what I commonly see since I've been a job for the previous years. So no matter at home, you know, I'm going to be able to do that.